Um, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of myself, Donald Fraser, and my co-moderator, Tamara Isakova, to this high-impact clinical trial session. It sh should be an absolutely fantastic session this morning. Um, we'll um, we'll uh, ask you in the question session to just say who you are and where you're from. If, if you're going to ask a question, that would be fantastic. Thank you. And we'll move straight on with the first uh, talk, which is uh, going to be given by Michelle Rowe uh, on behalf of the duplex investigators, uh, the Sparsantan versus Obasartan in patients with FSGS results from the duplex trial. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. And it's my pleasure to kick off the late breaking clinical trial session. On behalf of my co-investigators and the DuPro Steering Committee, I'm Dr. Michelle Rowe from the University of Minnesota, and I'm here to present the phase three duplex trial of Sparsentin versus Herbisartin in patients with FSGS. Relevant disclosures include that I was a site PI for this study and on the steering committee. Patients with FSGS have a high risk of progression to kidney failure despite current standard of care therapies with immunosuppression or RAS inhibition. Patients with FSGS who have nephrotic range proteinuria have an over 50% risk of reaching end stage kidney disease within five to 10 years of their diagnosis. So there's a high unmet need for therapies that reduce proteinuria and slow progression of this disease. Sparsentin is an orally active dual endothelin and angiotensin receptor blocker that reduced proteinuria in patients with FSGS in the phase two duet trial. Sparsentin works by individually binding to endothelin type A and angiotensin type one receptors and blocking intracellular signaling. Dual endothelin and angiotensin blockade has been shown to have a number of effects in preclinical models and in human kidney disease that include anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative, and anti-fibrotic effects. So with that background, the objective of the duplex study was to evaluate the efficacy and safety of sparsentin versus the active control herbisartin in patients with FSGS. This was a phase three, double-blind, active-controlled global trial. Key inclusion criteria included a biopsy-proven um, FSGS diagnosis or genetic testing consistent with a monogenic variant associated with FSGS. We excluded patients with secondary FSGS as defined by the local investigator. Additional key inclusion criteria included uh, patients between the ages of eight and 75, a urine protein to creatinine ratio greater than 1.5 grams per gram, and an EGFR of greater than 30. Patients receiving RAS inhibition had a two-week washout period, at which time they were randomized to either sparsentin or herbisartin. At two weeks, the dose was titrated to the target dose, which was 800 milligrams for sparsentin and 300 milligrams for herbisartin. Patients received drug for 108 weeks, at which time they had a four-week um, period where standard of care was resumed. The surrogate efficacy endpoint um, for this study was the FSGS partial remission endpoint, and this is defined as a urine protein to creatinine ratio less than 1.5 grams per gram and a 40% reduction from baseline. And this FSGS uh, partial remission endpoint has been associated with hard kidney outcomes of doubling of serum creatinine and kidney failure in prior studies. The primary endpoint for this study was EGFR slope. Total slope evaluated changes from day one to week 108 and chronic slope from week six to 108 to avoid confounding by the hemodynamic effects of both of these drugs. This was the largest study of FSGS ever completed and this study completely enrolled in under three years, despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. 724 patients were screened for eligibility and 371 were randomized. 184 received sparsentin and 187 received herbisartin. About 90% of patients in each group achieved the uh, target uh, dose. 91% of all of the patients completed the double-blind study period uh, so there was excellent retention in this study. Similar numbers of patients in each group discontinued drug, and reasons for discontinuation were similar in each group. Baseline demographics and clinical characteristics were also similar in each group. 
This was overall a young population, and there were 35 children overall enrolled in this study. This was also a population with a significant amount of proteinuria. Um, patients with sparsentin had a median protein to creatinine ratio of 3.1 and with herbisartin 3.0. Uh, between 9 to 10 percent of patients in uh, each group had a monogenic variant in a podocyte protein as a cause of their FSGS. About 7 to 8 percent had type 4 collagen variants, and 3 to 5 percent had APOL, uh, high risk APOL1 variants. The majority of patients were on RAS inhibition prior to the study, and about 25 percent in each group were on a baseline stable dose of immunosuppression at the time of enrollment. So now let's turn our attention to the efficacy results of the duplex study. At the 36-week interim analysis, patients treated with sparsentin were 55% more likely to achieve the FSGS partial remission endpoint. At 36 weeks, 42% of patients treated with sparsentin had reached partial remission compared to 26 weeks, um, or sorry, 26% uh, percent for patients treated with herbisartin. Importantly, this result was maintained through the end of the study at week 108, where 37.5% of patients treated with sparsentin had achieved partial remission compared to 22.6% of those treated with herbisartin. Proteinuria decreased rapidly in both groups with a larger reduction seen in patients with spar treated with sparsentin. The geometric mean reduction in proteinuria was 50% for those treated with sparsentin and 32.3% for those treated with herbisartin. And this proteinuria reduction effect was durable and sustained throughout the treatment period. Complete remission is an important uh, outcome for patients with FSGS, and it's associated with a decreased risk of kidney failure. In this study, patients treated with sparsentin were, who achieved complete remission were more likely in the sparsentin group. 18.5% um, of patients treated with sparsentin achieved complete remission at some time during the study, compared to 7.5% of those with herbisartin. And because all patients had a protein to creatinine ratio of greater than 1.5 at screening, this complete re, uh, remission represents at least an 80% reduction in proteinuria. Patients who were treated with sparsentin achieved complete remission earlier and sustained a complete remission longer than those treated with herbisartin. The primary endpoint in the study was EGFR endpoints. Looking at annual EGFR total slope from day one to week 108, uh, patients treated with sparsentin had a loss of 5.4 milliliters per minute per year compared to 5.7 milliliters per minute per year for those treated with herbisartin, and this was a difference of 0.3. Looking at chronic slope, uh, patients treated with sparsentin lost 4.8 milliliters per minute per year compared to 5.7 in those treated with, um, treated with herbisartin, and this was a difference of 0.9. The difference in chronic and total slope for the sparsentin group is accounted for by a larger acute drop of 4.1 milliliters per minute seen in the first six weeks of treatment compared to 0.8 milliliters per minute in the herbisartin group. A secondary endpoint of this study was change in EGFR from baseline to week 112. So if you recall, week 112 is four weeks after study drugs stopped, and this is looking for a durable effect of treatment. There was an absolute favorable benefit um, for treatment with sparsentin of 1.8 milliliters per minute. The, difference bet uh, the between group differences and EGFR endpoints were not statistically significant. About 16% of patients in each group um, either started or intensified their immunosuppression during the study period. In a pre-specified sensitivity analysis that excluded data after initiation or intensification of immunosuppressive treatment, there was a benefit to chronic slope for patients treated with sparsentin. The remainder of the sensitivity analyses were consistent with the main analysis. This study was not powered to show differences in composite kidney outcomes or kidney failure. However, these were examined as exploratory endpoints and all favored sparsentin. Uh, patients treated with sparsentin were less likely to reach a, a composite endpoint of 40% reduction in EGFR, end-stage kidney disease, or death. Um, similar findings were observed uh, if using a greater than 50% reduction of EGFR cutoff. And finally, a little over as half as many patients achieved end-stage kidney disease treated with sparsentin compared to herbisartin. So now we turn our attention to the safety data. 
Um, adverse events were, uh, rates were similar in each group. The most common adverse events were COVID-19, hyperkalemia, peripheral edema, and hypotension. Elevations in uh, uh, transaminases were uncommon and similar in both groups. There were no adverse events of heart failure. And fluid retention was not seen more often in the sparsentin treated group despite the relatively high dose of sparsentin used in this study. Both systolic and diastolic blood pressure decreased over the first four to six weeks, and this reduction was maintained throughout the study period. Uh, reductions in blood pressure were similar for patients treated with sparsentin and herbisartin. So in summary, this is the largest study of FSGS completed to date. It included a geographically diverse population of patients with a wide range of proteinuria and also included pediatric patients. This was also a unique study in that it used an active control group, unlike placebo or standard of care in other studies. The most important finding um, in the duplex study was that sparsentin, sustained, uh, sparsentin treatment sustained a reduction of proteinuria with higher rates of partial and complete remission and fewer sparsentin treated patients reaching kidney failure or a composite endpoint. Although the difference in EGFR slope was not statistically significant, the difference of almost one milliliter per minute per year um, of benefit could be clinically meaningful for patients and delay the need for renal replacement therapy if sustained over longer periods of time. And this is imp especially important for children with FSGS who are looking at a lifetime of, of kidney health. There were, the safety profile of sparsentin was comparable to that of herbisartin, and there were no significant adverse events of heart failure or liver injury, and no clinically meaningful fluid retention or edema concerns. So overall, these results indicate a clinical benefit of sparsentin for proteinuria reduction in patients with FSGS. I would like to thank the Trevere and Articulate Science teams for their help with uh, putting this presentation together. We would also like to thank all of the patients, families, investigators, and coordinators who made this study possible and stuck with it even through the COVID-19 pandemic. More information about this study is being published today in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this should be available now. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Um, the first question. Hello. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, Nirja Tandra. I'm a practicing nephrologist down in Virginia. Just a quick question about the comparable efficacy of the sparsantin, how you saw the difference in the blood pressure reduction. Did these patients on sparsantin were taken off of the ARB, did they have equivalent blood pressure control? through the study, or did they require more antihypertensive medication to be added on? Um, that's a, a good question. We have not looked at the uh, blood pressure medications that people were on through the study, um, other than the, the blood pressure measurements. We do have that information, and we'll be looking at that at a later date. Thank you, and that was an excellent presentation. Bob Toto, Dallas. Congratulations on the study, biggest study, and the major effect there on the um, proteinuria of the surrogate outcome. Um, there, there wasn't any significant difference, if I read your 95% uh, uh, confidence intervals correctly, on the EGFR outcome. Um, however, you, you did point out that there was a greater uh, percentage of people who completed had complete remission, uh, you know, by, by definition. And we know that as you Put on your slide, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of these FSGS populations. They had 50, about 50 patients dropped out or discontinued the study somewhere along the way in each of the groups. So I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is if you drill down, and perhaps it's in the paper and I'll read it, as to whether or not there are certain subpopulations within the, the group that you can identify that may, may have had a greater benefit. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of those people who had complete remission had much gentler EGFR slopes, both the chronic and the total. Yes, absolutely. I think there may be subpopulations within the FSGS population that may benefit more. Um, I'm particularly interested in looking at the gen patients with genetic FSGS because we really have no treatments um, that, are, that work for them. So this would be a major benefit if that 
um, can be held up. And as a pediatric nephrologist, I'm also very interested in seeing what the, um, how the pediatric patients responded in particular. And all of those, um, all of those uh, studies will be done at a later date. Yeah, it, they, and you had a uh, uh, small number, but you had some APOL1 patients in there. I wasn't sure if they had one or two copies. Uh, you didn't mention that, but you know that might be another group to, to drill down on, and since we have no real effective treatment yet for that. Yeah, absolutely. And there may, there may be a couple reasons that we did not um, achieve significance with that slope GFR. One uh, is that it, we simply may not have been following the, followed the patients long enough um, the study just may have been too short to make up for that acute drop at the beginning of the study. We also found that the control group treated with herbisartan did better than we expected them to. It turns out when you actually blind and uh, titrate herbisartan up to a, a standard dose that patients do better than the, um, than the uh, historic control groups. I, I'm sorry, we're going to have to, I apologize, but we don't have time for a final question. Maybe afterwards you can... Thank you very much again. So the second talk will be Brad Rovin um, from the JUPRO Steering Committee and Protect Investigators, Pivotal Results of a Phase 3 Protect Trial, Sparsantan versus Urbisartan in IGA Nephropathy. Well, thanks very much uh, for uh, having me here, and I'm happy to present the results of our phase three uh, PROTECT trial uh, looking at Sparsentan versus Herbisartan in IGA nephropathy. These are my disclosures and I was uh, an investigator and uh, uh, on the steering committee for this trial. So uh, you've just heard about what Sparsentan is, so thank you Michelle that I don't have to do that. Uh, the objective of this study was to compare uh, sparsentan versus the active control here, in this case, herbisartan, in patients with IgA. Just like in FSGS, the endothelin system is activated along with RAS uh, system in patients with IgA nephropathy, and uh, similarly, both systems can mediate kidney injury through multiple mechanisms, including inflammation and fibrosis. We postulated that treatment with sparsentan, as you know, is a dual endothelin and uh, angiotensin receptor antagonist, would be more efficient and effective at reducing proteinuria and preserving kidney function uh, in patients with IgA than treatment with a angiotensin receptor blocker alone. So similarly to what you just saw, this is the design of the uh, PROTECT trial. Uh, patients were maximized on ACE or ARB uh, pre-trial and then randomized one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to receive study drug or herbisartan. We had a run-in period uh, where we titrated the dose of sparsentan and herbisartan up uh, to 400 milligrams a day and 300 milligrams a day, uh, respectively. Um, and then the primary endpoint of this study was at week 36, and we looked at proteinuria. Uh, and then we continued the, the study for a little bit over two years, and the key secondary or confirmatory endpoints were to make sure that the change in proteinuria that we saw at week 36 translated into a kidney function benefit uh, for our patients. And the idea was similar to what you just heard. We looked at chronic slope that was annualized. Uh, we took all the data of GFR over the uh, two-year period of time, annualized to a rate of decline uh, of GFR in, in each group. We looked at chronic slope uh, because both uh, the ARB and uh, sparsentan have hemodynamic effects that drop GFR uh, quickly and early. And then we also looked at total slope from day one through week 110. These are the baseline demographics and clinical characteristics of the patients uh, in this study. I draw your attention in the red boxes to the age at uh, uh, IGA diagnosis and the age of informed consent. And you'll see there's a difference here. Uh, and I just want to point out that uh, many of the patients did not have a concomitant biopsy uh, when they entered the study, but had uh, a past kidney biopsy. All, all of them had a kidney biopsy showing IGA 
uh, nephropathy. Uh, the GFR, as you can see, showed moderate reduction, but similar in both groups, and both groups had about the same level of urine protein excretion per day. Now, importantly, uh, over the course of this study, uh, we were able to titrate uh, patients in both arms, almost all the patients in both arms, uh, to the desired dose of sparsentan or herbisartan. So to look first at the proteinuria results, if we focus on uh, week 36, which was the primary endpoint, and this has already been published, uh, you can see that uh, sparsentan led to a rapid decline in proteinuria uh, compared to the herbisartan group, and at week 36, uh, there was a 40%, 41% relative reduction in proteinuria in favor of those patients receiving sparsentan, and that was uh, statistically uh, significant. We continued looking at proteinuria over the uh, course of the entire study, and you can see that this difference was well maintained over 110 weeks. If you look at what we consider to be complete proteinuric remission for patients in IJ nephropathy, that is uh, a urine protein excretion less than 0.3 gram per day, uh, you can see that that was achieved in 31% of the patients receiving sparsentan compared to 11% of the patients uh, receiving herbisartan. To look at how these uh, proteinuria results uh, translated to preservation of kidney function, I'm illustrating here the uh, actual GFR changes from baseline uh, for both groups. Herbisartan is in the gray, sparsentan is in the green. Uh, you can see the acute hemodynamic effects as expected, uh, and you can see that un unfortunately in both groups there is a decline in, in GFR, but throughout the 110 weeks of measurement the GFR is superior in the sparsentan group. And in fact, if you look at the change uh, overall from baseline to week 110, uh, you can see that there was a loss of 5.8 mils per minute per year of GFR in the sparsentan group, but a loss of 9.5 mils per minute per year in the herbisartan group, so a difference close to 4 mils per minute per year. Uh, to analyze this, uh, as I said, the uh, uh, key secondary efficacy endpoints were to look at the annualized uh, GFR slope uh, because both groups lost a little bit of kidney function. Uh, both of these uh, slopes are negative, but you can see that the slope uh, for sparsentan, uh, looking at the chronic uh, slope model, uh, was less of a decline than the uh, slope of, of herbisartan. This was a 1.1 mil per minute per year uh, advantage to those patients on herbisartan, and that was statistically significant. When we look at the total slope, so that's from day zero all the way to uh, day 110, uh, you can see that we see the same uh, effect size uh, a one mil per minute per year advantage for those patients on sparsentan, uh, and that just missed statistical significance with a P of 0.058. When we looked at uh, subgroup analyses, again, thinking about slope, we divided patients into GFR below 60 or 60 or above, uh, and we used an annualized model of uh, a slope uh, that was the chronic slope or the um, total slope, and you can see uh, for both uh, GFR subgroups uh, this favored sparsentan. We looked at patients with baseline proteinuria less than 1.75 gram per day or greater than 1.75 gram per day, and again, the data in this forest plot suggest benefit from sparsentan with point estimates in favor, both in the chronic slope model and in the total slope model. Looking at a sensitivity analysis, we also did, uh, we analyzed the data in chronic slope and total slope, looking at an intention to treat uh, patient analysis, and you can see here that again, the results were uh, favorable for sparsentan in both slope models. 
We also looked at patients with rescue analysis, and these were the patients where we excluded the GFR measurements after initiation of rescue immunosuppression. We looked at a composite uh, kidney failure endpoint, and that composite consisted of a 40% reduction in uh, GFR, end-stage kidney disease or death, and a 50% reduction in end-stage, uh, uh, in GFR end-stage kidney disease or death. And you can see in both instances, uh, herbisartan uh, was unfavorable compared to uh, sparsentan, and this is the curve of herbisartan compared to sparsentan. In looking at the patients who initiated uh, immunosuppressive therapy, uh, you can see that the patients in the herbisartan group uh, started using immunosuppressive therapy earlier uh, and to a much greater extent than the patients in the herbisartan group. Uh, looking at the safety considerations, uh, I've highlighted here any uh, adverse event, and you can see that they were comparable between sparsentan and herbisartan, and looking at serious adverse events, again, spar uh, similar in both groups. Of particular relevance uh, to the use of an endothelin antagonist, peripheral edema was similar in both groups, and there was no increases in body weight. We had a low incidence of elevated liver function tests, and there were no cases of drug-induced liver injury with sparsentan. So to wrap up, sparsentan met its primary endpoint of proteinuria change at 36 weeks in the interim analysis with a sustained proteinuric effect over the course of the next uh, two years. This led to accelerated approval for use in patients by the FDA. The clinical benefit of sparsentan was confirmed by EGFR chronic slope analysis showing a statistically significant treatment effect versus maximally titrated herbisartan in this rigorously conducted trial. And then when we looked at the ITT analysis and other sub-analyses, uh, all of these GFR-based endpoints favored sparsentan. Uh, patients treated with sparsentan over two years exhibited one of the slowest annual rates of kidney functional decline seen in recent IgA trials. And we also suggest that this can be done safely with no specific safety signal from sparsentan and the safety data were comparable to what we generally use in IgA nephropathy and ARB. I'd like to thank uh, Traver for sponsoring this study. Uh, and also thank all the patients, families, and investigators who made this study possible. And, and as Michelle noted, this was completed during the pandemic, which was quite a feat. Uh, these data are discussed at more, in more detail uh, in The Lancet, and this should be available now-ish. Happy to entertain questions. Congratulations on the study. While we're waiting for people to come to the microphone, I wonder if you'd comment on the mechanism of proteinuria reduction, which seemed quite rapid in the study, and some of the effects of this drug class, as I understand it, m might have been expected to, so, so sort of anti-proliferative, anti-fibrotic effects maybe would be too slow for that to happen, so. Yeah, that, that uh, really does suggest that the combination of the endothelin antagonist with RAS inhibition, of course, is producing a hemodynamic effect, which will reduce uh, proteinuria. Absolutely agree that this is way too rapid for an anti-inflammatory effect or an anti-fibrotic effect. So it starts to make you wonder what it may be doing to the podocytes, which may be beneficial. And I'll throw that out as an hypothesis. I think it's worth investigating. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Jim Tumlin, Emory University. Terrific data, Brad. Really well presented. Uh, so I had a question. In the herbisartan group on the change in proteinuria, the initial drop was, if I remember correctly, was 14%. And by the end of the study period, it was back up to 4%. That struck me as possibly an uh, aldosterone escape phenomenon. Is it known whether endothelin alpha receptor antagonism can block reciprocal increases in aldosterone? 
thanks, Jim, for uh, an excellent question uh, for which I don't know the answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure we know all the things that endothelin antagonism is doing. Yeah. Uh, and I think that both of these studies, Michelle's and, and the PROTECT, uh, really sort of uh, lend themselves to asking more questions similar to your question, what are we getting that's beneficial here beyond what we think we're getting with endothelin antagonism? Well, thank you very much. Hello, uh, Stefan Nelson from the University Clinic of Nephrology and Hypertension in Gustav, Denmark. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. I was just wondering, were any of your patients on SGLT2 inhibition during the study period? There were very few on SGLT2 inhibition, but that's an outstanding question. And just to put this in perspective, uh, the PROTECT trial has an open label extension now in which we are combining with SGLT2 inhibitors. And we're running a de novo trial, which is starting up very shortly, like after the meeting here, uh, called Spartacus, in which we're going to look at the addition of SGLT2 inhibitor. And this is the expectation, of course, and again, these are my thoughts postulating, is that we would see additive effects uh, since we're presumably working through different mechanisms, although both have a hemodynamic effect. All right, thank you. Th thank you once again for an excellent So our third presenter is Tadeo Akizawa, who is presenting the IAMI study, um, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three study of bardoxolone and methyl in DKD patients. Chairperson, members of guests, I present the results of a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three study of bardoxolone methyl in DKD patient named Ayame study. Baldoxone method is an act, uh, activator of NAF2 and has been shown to continuously increase EGFR calculated by serum creatinine in several previous trials. However, the prior uh, phase three beacon study in DKD patient have been terminated prematurely uh, due to the development of heart failure. Later, postdoc analysis identified the risk factor for heart failure, uh, the, such as high BNP and history of heart failure. And the Japanese phase two trial, Tubaki study conducted to exclude those with these risk factors that Bardoxomethyl significantly increased GFR measured by inuring clearance. And the phase three IAM study was conducted to evaluate the efficacy and the safety of long-term treatment with Bardoxone methyl. This is the efficacy result of phase two tobacco study. In CKD stage three patient, the Bardoxone increased and not only the EGFR, but also GFR measured by inulin clearance after 16 weeks of treatment. Inulin clearance was assessed only in stage D3 patient, but Bartosterone majorly increased EGFR in stage 4 patient as well. Based on these results, we have started phase 3 Ayame study. IAM study is a multi-center placebo controlled randomized double blind trial. The study drug was administered for three years from the last subject enrolled in the study. And it has a 16 week follow up period after the end of treatment. During this study period, subjects would visit the study site at least once uh, every four weeks to examine, including EGFR. The dose of Bardoxomethyl started five milligrams per day, and it could be increased only if 
EGFR was lower than the baseline and there were no safety concerns up to 15 mg per day. The main inclusion criteria were DKD with an EGFR of 15 to less than 16 and ACR of 3,500 or less and the stable use of last inhibitor. Patient with a risk factor for heart failure were excluded. New prescription and change in dose for SGLT2 inhibitor and the GLP1 receptor agonists were prohibited during the study period. A primary composite, uh, the study utilized surrogate endpoint as efficacy analysis. The primary endpoint uh, was the time to uh, more than 30% decrease from baseline in EGFR with the onset of ESKD. And the uh, key secondary endpoint was the time to uh, more than 40% decrease in EGFR from baseline with the onset of ESKD. In this study, ESKD was defined as dialysis, GFR below six for at least four weeks, and kidney transplantation, and was evaluated by independent kidney event assessment committee. Other secondary endpoints include a more than 53 decrease in GFR, that means the doubling of serum creatine or ESKD, ESKD, change from baseline in EGFR. Adverse event were, and the time to the onset of cardiac event were also assessed by safety assessment. Totally, 1,020 subjects were randomized. 507 in Baldston group and 506 in placebo group. 304 and 331 subjects completed the treatment, and 287 and 321 completed the follow-up period. The detail of discontinuation of the studies are shown in this slide. There were no imbalance in the reason of the discontinuation between the groups. This slide shows the background of base and baseline data. There were no major difference between the two groups in any of the cases in gender, age, weight, BMI, EGFR, ACR, BNI, blood pressure, MYC, and so on. Here are the efficacy endpoint results. The primary endpoint shows the left panel and the key secondary endpoint are shown on the right spectrum. The both show a lower incidence in Baldston group than in placebo group. This is the event rate in the placebo group, and this is the event rate in the Baldston group in the primary endpoint and the key secondary endpoint. As shown in the forest plot, Primary endpoints had a rate is 0.56. And the key secondary endpoint has a rate of 0.69, indicate that by the strong group significantly reduced the occurrence of event. Other secondary endpoints are a 53 EGFR reduction or ESKD or ESKD. And uh, on, the, uh, on the left side, but uh, there are no major difference between the group and uh, this secondary endpoint and, uh, and ESKD. There was sharp increase uh, in the incidence uh, of the event near the end of the study, uh, which was due to the decrease in the number of the subject. Thank you. 
Uh, similarly, a forest plot is shown. Uh, although there was no significant difference in 53% redu reduction in EGF and ESKD here, it showed there were few events in Baldstrom group and the hazard ratio was 0.89. On the other hand, although there was no significant difference in ESKD, there were slightly more events in Baldstrom group and the hazard ratio was 1.21. As mentioned above, definition of ESKD in this study include EGFR below six continued for four weeks. So here is the outcome, only dialysis and kidney transplantation. Similar to the original ESKD, there were no significant difference in the occurrence of event between the two groups. Here are the change in EGFR. One of the secondary endpoint. As in the previous studies, EGFR increased from the beginning of the treatment in Baldustron group, and EGFR remained consistently elevated during the course of treatment, regardless of baseline EGFR or baseline ACR. However, EGFR decreased slowly after the end of treatment, and at 60 weeks after the end of treatment, it was almost the same as placebo. Some of the other kidney function parameters are shown, also shown. A serum creatinine in Baldston group, uh, decreased in Baldston group, as was a mirror change in an EGFR. But blood urea nitrogen did not differ between the two groups. The following is a list of adverse events as safety assessment. Events that occurred in 10% or more patients are shown here. There was no difference in TEAE, death, or serious adverse event between the two groups. In particular, muscle spasm increasing in the BNP were more common in Baldustin group than placebo group. These events, were simil these events were similar to those reported in previous studies, and there were no Baldustin specific safety risk newly shown in this slide, in this study. This figure shows the occurrence of cardiac event. This shows the composite endpoint of the event shown the top of the slide. The heart rated this, non-fatal myocardial infarction, heart failure required hospitalization, sudden death of unknown cause, unstable angina requiring hospitalization, and serious arrhythmia, which was evaluated by the Independent Heart Event Assessment Committee. As shown in this figure, there was no significant difference in the incidence of cardiac event in this study. In the efficacy assessment of this study, surrogate endpoint based on EGFR, such as a 30% reduction and a 40% reduction, significantly improved in Baldustron group, but there was a slight tendency for more ESKD event in Baldustron group. There may be two possible hypotheses that could explain the inconsistency between the surrogate and the hard endpoint. One is that, one is that based on the other renal parameter like blood urea blood nitrogen beside EGFR, it is suggested that the improvement of in GFR, EGFR by Baldustron may not actually reflect the true change in kidney function. Another one is that it may be possible that the Baldustron doesn't show improvement in EGFR in some population with a rapid decline in kidney function like those who reached ESKD in this study. However, we have no supportive data for this hypothesis. All of these are still hypotheses at this time. In conclusion, Baldustron increased EGFR 
as in previous, pre previous study. And this study achieved primary and key secondary endpoint. Among pre-selected patients who are at low risk of heart failure, there were no difference in the incidence of cardiac event between the two groups, and no new safety risks were identified. But strometry improved EJFR dependent composite endpoint. However, Baldoxtron did not decrease the event of ESKD compared with placebo. Further analysis and research are required to understand this inconsistency. Uh, this study could not be uh, conducted without the cooperation of many patients and the medical person from medical institution. We are truly grateful for them. Thank you for your kind attention. Th thank you very much. We have time for one question. Yeah, um, Ajay Singh from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. You showed a difference in uh, BNP, uh, an imbalance in BNP, with greater BNP uh, ele elevations in patients with, uh, treated with bardoxolone. You didn't show us the heart failure events. You showed us a composite. Can you tell us, was there an imbalance in heart failure events as a safety event between heart bardoxolone and? Heart failure. Heart failure again. Okay, thank you for your questions. The heart failure, or the heart failure requiring uh, hospitalization occurred at 10 in the placebo group and seven in the Bardoxone group. The number was low in the Bardoxone groups. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you again. I'm afraid in the interest of time, we must move on. Thank you very much for the presentation. And our fourth speaker is Catherine Tuttle, presenting um, the aldosterone synthase inhibition with or without background SGLT2 inhibition in CKD phase two clinical trial. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of my co-investigators in the ASI and CKD study group, I'm pleased to present this trial titled aldosterone synthase inhibition with or without background SGLT2 inhibition in CKD. This is a phase two trial. Here are my disclosures. People with chronic kidney disease remain at high risk of progression despite treatment with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and SGLT2 inhibitors. Aldosterone excess accelerates CKD progression. ACE inhibitors and ARBs do not fully block the effects of aldosterone and increase risk of hyperkalemia. SGLT2 inhibitors may add benefit to other CKD treatments while possibly mitigating hyperkalemia risk. Aldosterone synthase inhibitors directly lower aldosterone production and thereby may improve therapeutic efficacy for CKD. This phase two trial assessed the efficacy and safety of an aldosterone synthase inhibitor, BI690517, with or without empagliflozin in participants with CKD. Here is our study design, 714 adults with CKD, with or without type 2 diabetes, who were receiving background stable treatment at the maximally tolerated dose of an ACE inhibitor or an ARB for at least four weeks, were first randomized to a run-in period of either empagliflozin, 10 milligram daily, or its matching placebo. After an eight-week run-in run -in period, they underwent a second randomization to BI690517, either a matched placebo or doses at 3, 10, and 20 milligrams. And for the duration of the presentation, the 3 milligram will be represented in green, 10 in orange, and 20 in blue. The primary endpoint was the change in the urine albumin to creatinine ratio measured in a first morning void from baseline to week 14. Secondary endpoints were a responder analysis, that is the proportion of patients with greater than or equal to 15 or 30% reduction in the UACR at week 14. Additional endpoints included changes from baseline to week 14, an estimated GFR, serum potassium, blood pressure, plasma aldosterone, and morning serum cortisol, as well as a comprehensive safety assessment. Here are the baseline uh, characteristics and demographics by dose groups. They were comparable overall, 
and in total, two-thirds of the study participants were men. The mean age was approximately 64 years. 42% of the patients identified as non-white race, most, mostly Asian or black African American. 70% of the participants had type 2 diabetes. The mean baseline EGFR overall was 51.9 mil per minute per 1.73 meters squared, and the median urine albumin to creatinine ratio was 426 milligram per gram. Here are some additional demographics and baseline characteristics. Most importantly, the baseline serum potassium was 4.3 millimoles per liter. We had virtually 100% coverage with an ACE inhibitor or ARB with approximately two-thirds taking an ARB and approximately one-third taking an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And overall, 8% of patients were receiving a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Here are the primary outcome results. Without empagliflozin in the background, we found a dose-related reduction in albuminuria that was evident by six weeks and persisted over 14 weeks, but note that the dose response flattens at about 10 milligram. This is showing baseline to week 14 adjusted changes in the geometric mean of the urine albumin to creatinine ratio. Here at the 10 milligram dose group, the difference from placebo is 37%. Similar results were seen at the higher 20 milligram dose. With empagliflozin in the background, we have very similar results in terms of the dose response relationship, again, flattening at about 10 milligrams. And here we see a 46% reduction in albuminuria for a placebo corrected change of 40%. This is the responder analysis showing the 30. Those, the proportion of individuals who had a 30% or greater reduction in albuminuria from baseline. Note that the largest response rate was observed with BI690517 and empagliflozin in combination. 70% of people at the 10 milligram dose achieved this uh, outcome. And without empagliflozin in the background, it was 51%. Here are the changes in EGFR, first without empagliflozin, stable during the run-in period, a dip in EGFR of between 2 and 4 mil per minute per 1.73 meters squared that remains stable over 14 weeks. With IMPA in the background, we had a comparable dip from uh, the first randomization to the second randomization to BI or its matched placebo, and then an additional dip of about the same amount with stabilization over the 14-week period. Here are changes in systolic blood pressure without and with empagliflozin in the background. We would like to point out that the blood pressure reductions were larger in the combination group, ranging from 7 to 8 millimeters of mercury that was evident by the first two weeks and sustained over the 14-week uh, study period. Here are changes in plasma aldosterone first. This is re reflecting uh, target engagement. And you can see there were similar reductions in aldosterone without or with empagliflozin. The largest reduction, up to 66%, was observed uh, in the highest dose of, of BI690517, that is 20 milligrams, and it was up to 66% at maximum. There was no decrease of the mean cortisol level, again showing selectivity for aldosterone over cortisol. Here are changes in serum potassium. Without empagliflozin in the background, you can see that there was a mean increase that was at least dose-related between uh, from going from 3 to 10 milligram daily. And these are the placebo-corrected differences, ranging from 0.25 to 0.33 millimole per liter. With empagliflozin in the background, there may have been a partial mitigation of the increase in serum potassium. Here, the placebo-corrected change at the 3 milligram dose was 0 0.5, 0.32 at the 10 milligram dose, and 0.24 at the 20 milligram dose. Here are the overall safety and tolerability findings. I would like to point out that adrenal insufficiency was rare. There were one or two investigator-reported events in uh, the uh, 
dose groups, including one in a placebo, in a BI690517 matched placebo treated patients. So the numbers are small, uh, and there was no clear safety signal for adrenal insufficiency based on investigator report. Highlighting the hyperkalemia side effect, we'd like to point out that investigated reported hyperkalemia was more frequent in the BI dose groups, either without or with impagliflozin. However, there was not an obvious dose response relationship. Most cases, 86% were mild and not require treatment. However, six participants, which is 1% of the people on BI690517, had a measured serum potassium greater than six milliequivalent per liter sometime during the trial versus one participant, which was 1% of patients treated with placebo. The discontinuation rate for hyperkalemia was 4% with BI690517 versus none for placebo, and there were no fatal hyperkalemia events. So in conclusion, the selective aldosterone synthase inhibitor, BI690517, dose dependently reduced albuminuria by up to 40% compared to placebo in participants with CKD. These albuminuria reductions occurred in a similar magnitude and frequency with or without concurrent SGLT2 inhibition, suggesting additive effects. BI was 690517 was generally well tolerated with no unexpected safety findings. So aldosterone synthase inhibition is a promising new therapy that may add benefit to SGLT2 inhibition for CKD with or without type 2 diabetes. This therapeutic strategy will be tested further in a large phase three clinical trial. We're pleased to announce the Easy Kidney trial, which will be the phase three trial for BI690517. It will be conducted by Oxford Population Health and sponsored by Beringer Ingelheim. The trial will begin recruitment next year, and the aim is to test the efficacy and safety of aldosterone synthase inhibition versus matching placebo giving, given on top of the standard of care, including empagliflozin 10 milligrams daily. The study will recruit and follow about 11,000 patients with chronic kidney disease. We thank you to all the investigators and participants of this trial. You can view the presentation here. The study design and baseline characteristics uh, for this study were published earlier this week in the American Journal of Nephrology, and the main paper will be coming to you soon at a major journal. Thank you very much. Uh, it's especially nice to see the, 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 the efficacy in the SGLT2 treated people. And I just wonder, moving to the phase three study, is there a cumulative risk of adrenal insufficiency? So you had a, a small signal for adrenal insufficiency here. I guess the treatment's going to be much longer term in a phase three study. It, and that's, uh, that is going to be an important part of the phase three study as a more complete evaluation of safety, but these rates are really quite low overall. They're not unexpected, and there will be very careful attention to monitoring for any uh, evidence of adrenal insufficiency or hypocortisolism. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, very quick. A great presentation. Jim Tumlin from Memory. We just completed a trial looking at mass, uh, maximum rest blockade with uh, spironolactone and therapy in type 2 diabetics with over 1,000 milligrams of protein. And what we found was interesting, and I'm curious about this data, we had approximately 20% that were completely uh, unresponsive to any aldo blockade, zero change of proteinuria, and, and some that were uh, incredible hyper-responders. Did you see any kind of breakdown in this population between those kinds of subsets? You know, we have not looked at the subset analysis. I have to tell you, we didn't have this data until the first week in September. So those are a lot of the details that need to be unpacked. But overall, again, I want to emphasize that uh, among people who got both empagliflozin and BI690517, 70% of people had an albuminuria reduction more than 30%. So I think for many patients with chronic kidney disease, this is really an exciting new direction Great. that's really adding to our quiver of arrows that uh, we have now uh, that we can uh, aim t uh, toward reducing kidney disease risks. Thank you. Indeed.
Maybe just one final quick question about mechanism. There was a small additional blood pressure effect with the STLT. Do, would you comment on how important you think that is? Well, again, I mean, it's an interesting observation. This class of agents heretofore has mainly been studied as an antihypertensive agent, particularly in people with resistant hypertension. But many of our patients with CKD have resistant hypertension, so we actually view it as a package deal, better blood pressure control too. Okay, thank you. Thank you once again. Mo moving on, we're, we're going to uh, move to the presentation by Dr. Hido Hersping, uh, Zenith CKD, a phase 2B study of zebotentin in combination with dap dapagliflozin and dapagliflozin alone in patients with CKD. Good morning, everyone. It's my privilege to present the results of the Zenith trial on behalf of my co-authors and all investigators. Our disclosures are here. The trial was funded by AstraZeneca. In 2020, we demonstrated that the SGLD2 inhibitor dapagliflozin reduced the risk of a composite kidney endpoint in the DAPA CKD trial. In that trial, we also demonstrated that dapagliflozin reduced the risk of heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death and reduced albuminuria. One year before we demonstrated presented the DAPA-CKD trial, another trial was published with an endothelin receptor antagonist, atrazentin, and that trial demonstrated that atrazentin reduced the risk of a composite kidney endpoint and reduced albuminuria. However, endothelin receptor antagonists can cause fluid retention, which may lead to heart failure. And in the SONAR trial with atrazentin, there was indeed a tendency towards an increased risk for heart failure, as can be seen in the middle Kaplan-Meier curve. Based on these trials, we hypothesized that the combination, sorry, the slides don't progress. Can we have the next slide, please? No, it don't, doesn't. Is, is it possible to try to advance the slides from the technical? <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> Sorry for this. Sometimes, even in live meetings, yeah, it worked, yeah, yeah. Even in live meetings, we can have technical problems, and not only in virtual meetings. So we continue. The hypothesis of this trial was that combined treatment using dose-optimized zebotentin, which is a selective endothelin receptor antagonist, in combination with dapagliflozin, may further reduce albuminuria compared to dapagliflozin alone. And the addition of dapagliflozin Two zebotentin may reduce and mitigate zebotentin induced fluid retention. To test this hypothesis, we designed the Zenith CKD trial with the main objective to assess whether treatment with zebotentin in combination with dapagliflozin compared with dapagliflozin alone reduced UACR in people with chronic kidney disease with or without type 2 diabetes. The primary outcome of the trial was the change from baseline in log-transformed UACR, comparing zebotentin 1.5 milligram in combination with dapagliflozin versus dapagliflozin alone. Secondary endpoints were the changes in UACR for a lower dose of zebotentin combination, changes in blood pressure, and changes in EGFR over time. We enrolled adults with chronic kidney disease defined as an EGFR above 20 and albuminuria levels between 150 and 5,000 milligram per gram creatinine. We excluded patients with polycystic kidney disease, those with unstable heart failure requiring hospitalization, and patients with a BMP greater than 200 picogram per mil or anti-proBMP greater than 600 picogram per mil. The trial design consisted of two parts. In part one, we randomized patients to zebotentin 5 milligram 
dapagliflozin 10 mg, their combination or matching placebo. And then in the original trial design, we added two additional doses in part B, zebotentin 1.5 mg with dapagliflozin, zebotentin 0.25 mg in combination with dapagliflozin. The, the length of the follow-up was 12 weeks, followed by a two weeks washout period. However, part B became the main study because at an interim analysis, the Data Safety Monitoring Board recommended the discontinuation of the zebotentin 5 mg group and the zebotentin 5 mg in combination with dapagliflozin group because of increased fluid retention. Fluid retention was defined as a B body weight increase of more than 3% or a doubling of BMP. And this Kepler-Meyer curve shows that at 12 weeks, the Kepler-Meyer incidence for fluid retention was 35% for zebotentin 5 mg. And although it was reduced with dapagliflozin and zebotentin 5 mg to 20%, this was still considered too high. Because evolving clinical practice guidelines recommended the SGLD2 inhibitors in patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease at this interim analysis, we also decided to discontinue the placebo arm. So Part B became the main study. And patients in Part B were enrolled at 18 countries at more than 160 clinical practice sites shown here in this map. The patient disposition is shown here. We randomized 525 participants, but we excluded participants who were participating in Part A of the study, leaving 447 participants for Part B. Of these, 331 completed the study. Their baseline characteristics are shown here. Mean age was 63 years. About one third of the participants were female. About 60% had a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and the mean GFR was 47 mils per minute. Median UACR was 566 and this table shows that the baseline characteristics were well balanced across the three treatment groups. Zebotentin in combination with dapagliflozin reduced albuminuria more than dapagliflozin alone. And this effect was evident already after three weeks of treatment and was sustained over time. During the washout period, we see that the albuminuria levels returned to baseline. At 12 weeks, zebotentin 0.25 in combination with dapagliflozin reduced albuminuria by 48%. The 1.5 zebotentin combo group reduced albuminuria by 53% and dapagliflozin alone at 12 weeks by 28%, corresponding to between-group differences of 27 and 34% reduction in albuminuria. The EGFR fell directly after one week of treatment in all treatment groups, with a slightly larger reduction for the zebotentin 1.5 mg group. These reductions in GFR were completely reversible during the two weeks washout period. Blood pressure was more reduced with zebotentin combination with dapagliflozin compared with dapagliflozin alone, and this effect was again directly evident after one week of treatment and sustained during the 12 weeks treatment period. During the washout, blood pressures returned to baseline. Now, focusing on the safety, we looked at adverse events leading to drug discontinuation. And here I'm presenting all drug discontinuation adverse events that occurred in at least two participants. Most of these events were related to fluid retention, but these events were not different comparing zebotentin 0.25 in combination with dapagliflozin compared to dapagliflozin alone. But for the zebotentin 1.5 dapagliflozin combination group, we see slightly higher um, fluid-related adverse events that led to drug discontinuation. Serious adverse events were not different between the dapagliflozin zebotentin 0.25 mg group and dapagliflozin alone treatment group. And again, slightly higher um, adverse events for the zebotentin 1.5 combo group. Adverse events of clinical interest are shown in the bottom of the table. And these are adverse events occurred slightly more frequently in the zebotentin 0.25 dapagliflozin group and also in the zebotentin 1.5 dapagliflozin group. Of course, we were particularly interested in fluid retention. And here we looked at mean body weight B 
BMP and fluid retention events. Body weight increased for the zebotentum 1.5 dapagrel flosin group did not change for the zebotentum 0.25 milligram dapagrel flosin group and was reduced with dapagrel flosin alone after one week of treatment. Over time, body weight decreased in all three treatment groups, which is likely a reflection of the glycosuric effects of dapagrel leading to body weight reductions. BMP increased for the zebotentum 1.5 DAPA group, but there was no difference in BMP over time for the lower dose zebotentum DAPA cleflozin combination group compared to DAPA cleflozin alone. Fluid retention events, as defined as a body weight increase more than 3% or a dub doubling in BMP, were more frequently occurring in the zebotentum 1.5 DAPA cleflozin group, but were not different for the lower zebotentum. Dapacleflozin group compared to Dapacleflozin alone. A strength of this study was that we also measured fl fluid status by bioimpedance spectroscopy. Total body water increased for the zebotentum 1.5 DAPA combo did not change over time for the zebotentum 0.25 DAP DAPA combo and was reduced with Dapacleflozin alone and similar patterns were seen for extracellular and intracellular volume. So zebotentin dapagliflozin led to a marked reduction in albuminuria in this phase 2B clinical trial. Other significant effects on blood pressure and also on LDL cholesterol, HbA1c and uric acid were seen. The fluid retention profile of a low dose combination supports further clinical trials. And results of these larger and longer studies in high risk CKD populations are awaited. And it's now my pleasure to announce that we have started recruitment in the Zenith High Proteinuria trial, which is a phase three outcome trial to determine the long-term efficacy and safety of combined zebotentin dapagliflozin. It's also my pleasure to announce that these results of the Zenith CKD phase 2B trial are now available online in the Lancet. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Bob Toto, Dallas Hedo, congratulations on the study and the publication. Um, I was curious as to um, the magnitude of the reduction in the proteinuria in the combination group, and particularly with respect to the blood pressure change. It appeared that there was a substantially greater reduction in blood pressure in the combination group as compared to the dapagliflozin. Um, uh, and so I'm wondering if you're attributing any of the a reduction in proteinuria to that blood pressure uh, difference. And I, I didn't know if it was for statistically significant numbers, but we, we know that the DAPA is expected to reduce the blood pressure by two to three millimeters of mercury, but it looked like it was closer to eight or nine in the combination if I read the slide correctly. Yeah, you're correct, Bob. The blood pressure reductions were 7.6 and 3.6 millimeter mercury for the combination versus dapagliflozin alone. And of course, we were also interested whether these blood pressure reductions were driving the reductions in albuminuria that we observed. So we correlated the change in blood pressure with the change in albuminuria, and you can read the details in the Lancet, and there was no correlation whatsoever for the changes in blood pressure with changes in albuminuria. So the mechanism is likely different than the blood pressure reduction uh, for the albuminuria reduction. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, can you comment um, on the selection of the population? You chose broad selection, just CKD. The first two trials focus on FSGS and IgA nephropathy. Can you comment on that decision and then if there were any subgroup effects, let's say diabetes yeah. versus not? Yeah, we enrolled a broad population of patients with chronic kidney disease. As I said, 60% had type 2 diabetes, 40% did not have diabetes, and the effects on albuminuria were consistent in patients with and without um, diabetes. 
further analyses are ongoing to specifically look at the patient with IgA nephropathy. I believe there were 10% of patients with IgA nephropathy, a smaller subgroup, and I don't know, but I think we don't have enough patients to specifically look at the FDS, FSDS population. Okay, great. And one more question. Uh, can you comment on whether in the phase three trial there will be specific steps in the design uh, to assure that there isn't fluid retention in case the DAPA gliflozin is discontinued by the patient? That's a really good question. Uh, we, we specifically assess the effects in, uh, with a low dose zebotentin to avoid that, that the risk. Um, we, uh, we are we don't, I don't know if we have specific rules in the protocol that if patients stop the um, dapagliflozin. However, the dose of this drug is very, very low. So with that, we already mitigate a lot of the fluid retention that we saw with the five milligram dose earlier on. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, the next presentation will be by Patrick Rossignol, and it will be on uh, the uh, Alchemist trial, Aldasterone Antagonist Chronic Hemodialysis Intervention Survival Trial, primary results. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. It's my privilege to present you on behalf of my co-investigators on the steering committee, the results, the primary results of the Alchemist trial, this was a phase three trial, academically funded, essentially funded by the French Ministry of Health, sponsored by the Brest University Hospital and supported by our academic initial city network. We are all aware that our chronic hemodialysis patients still experience dismal outcomes, especially cardiovascular outcomes, and that so far, no drug convincingly demonstrated efficacy toward cardiovascular protection in this specific patient population. We hypothesize that the overactivation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system may play a key role here, based on the central role demonstrated in experimental studies on left ventricular hypertrophy, arterial stiffness, inflammation, extracellular matrix remodeling, vascular calcification, and myocardial fibrosis all non-predictors in epidemiological observational studies of cardiac deaths in CKD patients with or without heart failure. Furthermore, it is strongly recommended, it is a 1A recommendation, to use steroidal mineral receptor antagonists in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction and an EGFR above 30 ml per minute. Furthermore, in these major trials, ephesus, emphasis, and RALS, it was demonstrated that an antifibrotic effect of steroidal MRAs was involved. Finally, there is a known association between aldosterone concentration in blood and cardiac deaths in hemodiasis patients. We therefore aimed at investigating the effects of the steroidal mineral receptor antagonist paranolactone on cardiovascular outcomes in a high-risk hemodiasis population. We therefore designed an international multicenter, double blind, randomized, placebo controlled, event driven trial of the steroidal mitocardial receptor antagonist paranolactone in hemodialysis patients with at least one cardiovascular comorbidity, for instance, history of heart failure, a stroke, MI, abnormalities such as left ventricular hypertrophy or risk factors such as diabetes. The key exclusion criteria encompassed hyperkalemia above 5.5 mmol per liter during the two weeks prior to randomization, symptomatic and dietic, interdietic hypotension on any prior concomitant clinical condition compromising the inclusion based on the investigator judgment. Spironolactone, 25 milligrams every other day, was firstly administered open label during a one month running phase during which Serum potassium was measured three times a week, and patients were excluded prior to randomization should serum potassium be greater than 5.5 millimol per liter on two occasions during this running period or on the day of randomization. Randomized patients were subsequently uptitrated to spiral of placebo 25 milligrams a day uh, according to a pre specified algorithm 
the one used in emphasis on emphasis HF based on serum potassium monitoring, keeping in mind that the target dose was 25 milligrams a day with the possibility to don't titrate every other day or to temporarily discontinue the drug and to resume it as soon as the serum potassium gets to normal. Meanwhile, should hyperkalemia happen, the investigators were allowed to use their usual standard protocols, which may encompass either di uh, additional diet restriction, the use of potassium binders, or low K bass. The primary efficacy endpoint was the time to the onset of the first adjudicated expanded mass event, non-fatal MI, acute coronary syndrome, hospitalization for heart failure, non-fatal stroke, or cardiovascular death. A series of secondary outcomes was considered, including in a hierarchical strategy, the composite twin ratio of all-cause mortality on time to cardiovascular event, non-fatal, at two years. And additional secondary objectives were considered, both efficacy, such as atrial fibrillation, quality of life, using uh, three PA rules, and safety incidence of hyperkalemia above six minimal per liter. What about the sample size? To make a long story short, 825 patients were needed to be included in the renin phase, considering that 750 randomized patients were to be followed for two years to provide 80% power to detect a risk reduction of the primary endpoint by 30%, with an alpha risk of 5%, assuming uh, an event rate of 19.84 per, per 100 percent years, considering a potential study con discontinuation rate of 10 percent, and further 10 percent withdrawal dropout rate during the, randomiz during the running phase. Additionally, three safety analyses were pre-specified, led by an independent DSMC. Trial conduct, the first visit in first patient occurred on June 2013. Pre specified, the pre specified blind assessment of the adjudicated event rate happened to be lower than initially expected. And delays in patient recruitment led us to firstly increase the patient follow up duration to a maximum of four years and to stop the trial after a two year follow up of the last recruited patient per sponsor decision. Finally, the last patient first visit occurred in November 2020. The last visit in last patient occurred on November 2022. And the database, database lock was performed three weeks ago on October the 9th, 2023. Patients were recruited from three countries, France in the metropolitan area, as well as overseas in the Indian Ocean Reunion Island. 9,000 kilometers from Paris, in Belgium, in Monaco. 823 patients were included. 644 were randomized. This is the ITT population. There was a median 32.6 months follow-up. 248 patients completed the study. On 396 withdrew the main reason for withdrawal being death, which occurred in 247 patients. Now the baseline characteristics in, the, in this sick population, these were well balanced, 71 year old median, 66% of men, diabetes 70%, history of cardiovascular disease, 75%, history of hospital hospitalization, 12%. What about drugs? SRRs were uh, pre present, administered to a quarter, beta blocker, a third, statins, 60%, antiplatelet, 20%, potassium binder, 45%, while low KBAS, two minimal per liter, were administered to 50% of the patients. Dialysis vintage was 1.6. They were well treated with a KT over V of 1.5. Of note, 45% were treated with online hemodia filtration. Now it's time for me to present you the primary outcome. The Kaplan-Meier curves, 
with the hazard ratio of 0.99, the p-value of 0.98, and obviously spironolactone did not significantly reduce time to first cardiovascular event. Further focusing on the component, the individual component of the primary endpoint, you see in this quite busy slide that CVDS, MI, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, similarly did not significantly di differ between groups. If any hospitalization for heart failure was significantly decreased by 59% with a p-value of 004, on subsequent secondary analysis will enable us to better understand the, underst to better understand the meaning of this signal. Further considering time to non-fatal cardiovascular event, there was a similar non-statistically significant reduction. What about the potential heterogeneity across pre specified subgroups? Amongst all these specified subgroups, we identify a single statistically significant p-value for interaction, which concerns patients above or below 75 years. In other words, patients above 75 experience a hazard ratio of 1.5 compared to those below 75, uh, hazard ratio of 0.75. Secondary outcomes were inherently exploratory. The RIN ratio was non-statistically significant. Non-CV death was non-statistically significant. All those deaths was not significantly altered. The same applies for the quality of life. What about safety? In this very sick patient population, more than 9,000 adverse events were recorded. There was a slight increase, 4% increase in the event rate in the spironolactone group. Uh, with regard to the AEs of special interest, hyperkalemia, either mild to moderate or, or severe hyperkalemia, you may notice here that these events were highly prevalent 45% in both groups, with a slight increase, 3% in the spinolactone group. In contrast, gynecomastia was uh, an uncommon event, increased threefold in the spiral group, and arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, was halved in the spinolactone group. We conclude from this phase three trial that in patients under chronic hemodialysis on at least one cardiovascular comorbidity abnormality of risk factor, Treatment with spironolactone did not significantly reduce the incidence of the primary composite outcome. The treatment was well tolerated. And of the components of the primary outcome, only hospitalization for heart failure had a significantly lower incidence in the spironolactone group. Secondary analysis will help us understanding this finding. And my last slide is to deeply acknowledge all patients engaged in the trial, local investigators, some of them are sitting here, trial committees, especially my, uh, my uh, twin co-chair, Luc Frima, all the committees, participants, the trial was sponsored by University Hospital of Brest, supported by our clinical research network, on, uh, essentially funded by the French Ministry of Health, where additional grants were obtained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start off with some questions. Uh, can you comment on uh, whether uh, you had information on residual renal function and if that's Sorry. residual renal function? Sorry, residual, oh, so, yeah. residual function, uh, this will be presented in the paper when submitted. Uh, as, as a surrogate, we have the, the prevalence of diuretic use uh, as a potential surrogate. I guess it, it was uh, around 50%. Right, and then sort of a related comment. Now that you've done this really important trial in the dialysis population, have you had thoughts that perhaps this should be done earlier in the course of CKD, maybe late stage four or five? Sh should this be done in an earlier CKD population, this trial? So, as usual, uh, when we are faced to a neutral trial, uh, we may wonder whether this was the right population to late, perhaps, Perhaps it, it's, it could have been another dosing, another uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, another trial design. Uh, there are always the same questions. 
but uh, importantly, we have a large uh, biomarker program which will provide major insights onto pathophysical insights uh, in this population. Excellent. Um, Ajay Singh from the Brigham. Um, the cardiovascular death, um, the capillary Meyer curves, at around 24 months, you started seeing separation where there was an unfavorable uh, pattern for uh, Spiro. Do you think your trial was underpowered? And if you had, uh, I mean, you uh, under recruited based on your uh, sample size, could you speculate on that? Sure. So, uh, f first of all, the fact that the final hazard ratio was 0.99 uh, leave us to, to say that power was not a matter of concern anyway. Should uh, we have uh, seen the same hazard ratio in a, in a larger population? So, power was not an issue. By the way, we computed... But the hazard was 1.26. Yeah, but over, uh, yeah, that's true. But overall, considering the composite outcome, which was uh, overwhelmingly uh, 0.99, but th that's, that said, uh, we expected to have uh, a, a certain number of events per uh, sample size assumption, and we got ultimately 75% of the events uh, uh, recorded. So we don't think, finally, that there was any issue with the power. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Amit Garg, and he'll present on effect of multi-component intervention to improve patients' access to kidney transplantation and living kidney donation. <coughs> So on behalf of the ENACT LKD investigators, we thank the ASN for the opportunity to present this trial, which was made possible by several organizations. Today, full results are published in JAMA Internal Medicine with a commentary from Dr. Ebony Bulware, and it's discussed in a freely filtered podcast with guest Sue McKenzie, a kidney transplant recipient and founder of the patient support group used in this trial. I declare Estellas Canada provided support to create educational materials used in this trial. Declarations for other co-authors are in the paper. Uh, for history, I shared plans for this trial at ASN Kidney Week 2016 in an investigator award talk. And what I said then, and what I say today, is that we have a serious problem in kidney care. Patients with advanced chronic kidney disease have the best chance for a longer and healthier life if they receive a kidney transplant. And every 100 kidney transplants save the healthcare system 20 million over five years, primarily from averted dialysis costs. And yet, due to many barriers, many eligible patients today will never receive a transplant. Leaders in the province of Ontario, Canada decided to address this problem. For context, in Ontario, advanced CKD care is provided by 26 renal programs managed by a government-funded provincial renal agency. Together, these programs treat 24,000 patients each year approaching the need for dialysis or receiving dialysis. Care is provided by over 3,600 nurses and nephrologists and half of patients are transplant eligible. 725 kidney transplants are done each year across six transplant centers with 30% of kidneys coming from living donors. And prior to 2017, improving access to transplant was not a priority for the renal agency. So using a process described in the paper, a multi-component intervention was co-designed with a broad group of stakeholders to address several barriers which prevent kidney transplantation and living donation. These components were administrative support from a central operations group for each program to establish a local quality improvement team to drive performance and share best practices with other teams in monthly provincial rounds. Educational resources for health professionals patients and potential donors, several resources were curated for use, and one resource, Explore Transplant Ontario, was created and mass-produced. A 
patient support group called the Transplant Ambassador Program, where past recipients and living do donors voluntarily spend time in renal programs to share experiences and provide hope. And finally, reports which showed programs how their patients were com completing different steps towards receiving a transplant, which were also discussed annually in one-on-one -on -one performance meetings between program leaders and the provincial renal agency. Leaders also agreed to generate robust estimates of the intervention effect in this pragmatic cluster randomized trial to determine if renal program-wide use of this multi-component intervention is superior to usual care in helping eligible patients complete up to four key steps towards receiving a transplant. These four key steps Statistically analyzed in a multi-state model were one, referral to a transplant center for evaluation, which in Ontario is done by a renal program after they complete required pre-evaluation testing. Two, having a person contact a transplant center to begin living donor evaluation, where patients with multiple potential donors only had the first one counted. Three, being added to the deceased donor wait list. And four, receiving a transplant from a deceased or living donor. Having the same issue. In terms of the trial design, both the protocol and statistical analysis plan were published before outcome analysis. It was implemented as a part of a learning healthcare system, which meant there were no research coordinators at the 26 programs. It was published with patients and healthcare administrators as full partners, and it generated high quality information at a fraction of the cost of a usual trial. It was registry based, with baseline and outcome data coming from healthcare databases. It used covariate constrained randomization to allocate 13 of the 26 programs to each of the two groups, and it was approved by the Research Ethics Board to use waived patient consent, which meant all eligible patients who received care in the 26 programs entered the trial. To enter the trial, patients were aged 18 to 75 years with no recorded contraindication to receiving a transplant in our data sources, such as no evidence of home oxygen use, living in a long-term care facility, select cancers, or very high comorbidity. Patients approaching the need for dialysis received care in specialized clinics and had persistent evidence of an EGFR less than 15 or a greater than 25% two-year predicted chance of receiving renal replacement therapy. Remaining patients entered the trial after receiving outpatient maintenance dialysis in a center or at home. And during the 4.2 year trial period, about 10,000 patients entered the trial in each of the two groups for a total of 20,000 patients, and half were approaching a need for dialysis. The analysis used an intention to treat approach. In follow up, 1% of patients emigrated from the province, 1% recovered kidney function, 14% became ineligible to receive a transplant, and 17% died. And these rates were similar between the two groups. Patients rarely crossed over between the two groups. Specifically, patients spent 97% of all fall time receiving care in a program per the random allocation. And of interest, for the group approaching dialysis, 48% started dialysis during the trial period at a rate that was similar between the two groups. As shown in the paper, the two groups were well balanced on over 50 program level and patient level baseline characteristics. The mean age was 61, 38% for women. For those who entered the trial approaching a need for dialysis, the median EGFR was 16, and the median random urine ACR was 158 milligrams per millimole. And 1% had a prior history of kidney transplant. And we observed evidence of intervention uptake. Each of the 13 programs established a local quality improvement team 
developed a charter with their goals and activities, met regularly, and participated in monthly provincial rounds. Together, the programs reported over 1,700 patients completed Explore Transplant Ontario. The transplant ambassadors recorded meaningful interactions with over 5,000 patients with advanced CKD and 700 potential living donors. And each of the 13 programs received reports and met annually with the provincial renal agency to review performance. As described in the paper, we observed no evidence of potential contamination bias. Programs in the usual care group did not inadvertently gain access to intervention materials. And so here are the main results of the trial. On the x-axis, we have the 4.2 year trial period in calendar months. And through this animation, the counter will move right. On the y-axis, we have the number of steps completed standardized for 10,000 patients in each group who entered the trial. We're, as a reminder, the four steps were referral, donor evaluation, wait list, and transplant. We had the two groups. Patients entered the trial throughout the trial period, and after entry, they were followed for a meeting of 2.1 years. The start of the pandemic, 2.4 years into the trial period, substantially impacted intervention delivery for at least a year. Quality improvement teams met less often, provincial rounds were paused, healthcare staff were retired or were redeployed, and the transplant ambassadors transitioned from in-person to virtual meetings. Referrals, donor evaluations, and transplants throughout the province were also delayed at this time. So the trial began, and this is what we observed. There was no significant difference between the two groups in the rate of completed steps with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.0. Numerically, there was a higher rate of donor evaluations in the intervention group with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.22. However, the 95% confidence interval of this ratio contained a value of 1. As shown in the paper, we did not detect a significant difference between the two groups in different sets examined in isolation or in combination, in different subgroups, or in the rate of living kidney donor transplants. And the proportion of patients who completed at least one step, at least two steps, at least three steps, and four steps during the trial period did not differ between the two groups. So in conclusion, acknowledging the pandemic negatively impacted intervention delivery we failed to show this intervention increased access to kidney transplantation and living donation. However, we are not giving up. We and others are deeply committed to addressing this complex and important problem. After much introspection, we believe several aspects of our systems approach remain sensible. Co-designing solutions with diverse stakeholders, connecting health professionals and a community of leading practice, delivering patient and health professional education multiple times and in multiple formats, empowering past recipients and donors to share positive experiences with others, monitoring and reporting key steps towards receiving a transplant, and evaluating intervention effects robustly in a learning healthcare system. And so we are now completing a process evaluation to optimize our future approach, and some early data suggests better integration of different aspects, more healthcare resources for intervention delivery, better retraining for personnel who turn over, and making it clearer who is accountable for what may lead to future success. So on behalf of the ENACT LKD investigators, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, can you comment on um, any health policy efforts that could help address some of the barriers
years you've had? Well, outside of this trial, some of the uh, policy or program level activities that have occurred in Ontario, just like many other jurisdictions, is for example, reimbursing living donors for their legitimate expenses so that they're not finally financially disadvantaged when they're being evaluated and incurring costs or even at the transplant uh, time itself. That'd be one example. And then uh, a, a sort of a separate question. Uh, these pragmatic clinical trials are really hard to do. You didn't have research coordinators and the staff during the pandemic were probably overburdened. Um, and you mentioned some of the lessons uh, related to that. Uh, let's say you were designing this again. H how would you uh, make this um, specific barrier that the people on the ground might not be able to fully put your intervention into use? Uh, how, how would you overcome that barrier? Well, one of the considerations around pragmatic trials is you're trying to deliver the intervention as it would be delivered in routine care. So there's this tension. If you provide too many resources, that won't be sustainable in routine care. And so in this context, we were trying to empower local healthcare staff to really take charge of this important issue. Uh, certainly we can provide more resources within a, um, a research coordinator context, but then again, it's not going to mimic what's going to happen after the trial. Hi, uh, Rob Starr, NIH. Um, beautiful study, well designed, difficult to carry out. One of the things that struck me was the peer to peer network piece that you had two or three times the number of patients involved in that as any of the other pieces. To me, that seems to be one of the answers getting to Dr. Sakova's question. Are you planning to exploit that aspect? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Starr. So Although it didn't show up in the quantitative results, we received a lot, a lot of positive feedback around the Transplant Ambassador Program. Many patients felt this was deeply meaningful for them. I didn't share anything about experience or culture uh, in the results. And some of the Transplant Ambassadors were so um, moved by this experience that they became Transplant Ambassadors themselves. So we definitely feel there's a lot of value there and we're trying to look at how to optimize it even further. Go ahead, last question. Uh, Andy Levy from Boston. It's really a remarkable uh, effort that you've assembled uh, in the setting of a province that has access to integrated healthcare and data. So congratulations on leveraging all that. It strikes me that maybe there aren't enough deceased donors and living donors to be able to show a different despite these efforts. And that uh, it, perhaps it would be more uh, profitable on top of this to re-examine the uh, reasons for rejecting donors as living donors or rejecting uh, deceased uh, de donor kidneys. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Levy. So in this trial, because it, again, it is very hard to move the needle just on transplant alone, that's why we had some of these upstream measures. Was the person being referred for transplant evaluation? Did at least one living donor candidate come forward for evaluation, even if they weren't deemed suitable to ultimately donate? And I agree with you, we do need to have these early measures to get a sense of some of our interventions that are working, because if you wait till the end, you might not, you might not see any effects. Thank you very much. Um, I have one question as well, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, so thank you very much. I thought that was a very excellent um, presentation and also efforts as well to get everyone involved so that's a really big deal but my questions really are I wonder if you would have seen differences in patients from ethnic minority groups often these patients have a lower disadvantage in terms of access to transplantation and also I'm curious as well is your standard of care just really good in Ontario overall and then my third comment is um, yeah, I wonder if like, you know, in terms of the referrals that you saw less of in the complex care intervention, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. Often just educating patients and them making the right informed choice about whether to pursue kidney transplantation is a positive. Maybe in the interest of time, I'll just address the first part of that question. Sure. So uh, in terms of equity and access to transplant, I fully agree with you. That's a really important issue. Some aspects of in this trial intervention were that the transplant ambassadors tried to match like with like. So if someone had a certain background, a certain age, 
how they self-identified, never putting anything on them, but they self-identified with a certain culture, certain language, certain age or, or background. The trans ambassadors did try to um, align that. And as well in the education materials, there was representation from multiple different um, segments, including cultural, First Nations groups in Ontario, et cetera, to try to show people were being represented in the videos. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go on to the last presentation, which will be presented by uh, Daniel Brennan, MDR 101 MLK Update, Operational Immune Tolerance Achieved in Living-Related HLA-Matched Kidney Transplant Recipients. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, the organizers, the moderators. Thank you for allowing me to present on the MDR Meteor 101 MLK Matched Living Kidney Update, Operational Immune Tolerance Achieved in Living-Related HLA Matched Kidney Transplants on behalf of the MDR 101 investigators. These are the disclosures. All investigators had no financial interest. This study was supported by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, and I serve on the editorial board of Transplantation Up to Date. This is um, uh, uh, performed under an IND, and the tr tr clinical trials uh, governor, the .gov number is NCT 033639455. The MDR-101 study is a phase three multi-center international randomized controlled study. The rationale is that kidney transplantation, as you heard, requires lifelong immunosuppressive therapies that are associated with side effects, infection, and malignancy, and it's expensive. The MDR-101 is an investigational allogeneic cellular product intended to re induce mixed chimerism and immune tolerance to allow the elimination of all immunosuppressive drugs while preserving transplant function and averting transplant rejection. The primary study objective is to achieve functional immune tolerance in HLA-matched living-related donor kidney transplant recipients. Functional immune tolerance is defined as being off all immunosuppressive drugs for at least 24 months out of at least 36 months post-transplant with no episodes of biopsy-proven acute rejection, de novo donor-specific uh, DSA, transplant kidney loss or rejection. We also wish to compare the safety and tolerability of the MDR product to the standard of care in these transplant patients. The primary efficacy endpoint was a proportion of patients treated with the MDR product and achieving functional immune tolerance. Primary and secondary endpoints were and will be evaluated based on a representative contemporary historical control of data derived from the SRTR, the uh, Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients database, and also it will mimic several of the basic eligibility criteria and protocol of immunosuppressive drug therapies. The treatment success rate was conservatively anticipated to be 48 percent in the MDR investigational arm versus 9 percent in the historical control, and the protocol design and endpoints were agreed upon with the FDA in a special protocol assessment, or SPA. This is a schematic of the trial design. It's open labeled, two to one, 20 patients in the investigational arm, 10 patients in the control arm, all HLA matched, six out of six for A, B, and DR, living related donor kidney transplant recipients, ages 18 to 70, ABO identical. They had to have their first single solid organ, kidneys only, and no high risk underlying kidney disease such as lupus or taking immunosuppression at the time of transplant. The donors had to be healthy. In the boxes shown the MDR product criteria. So the MDR 101 is a stem cell product consisting of greater than 4 million CD positive, CD34 positive stem cells per kilogram and 1 million CD3 positive T cells per kilogram. The patients received total lymphoid irradiation, that's TLI, that's important, it's not TBI, which is routinely used in stem cell and bone marrow transplants. The patients received rapid ATG thymoglobulin, five doses, 
at 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, and the patients had to achieve mixed chimerism greater than or equal to 5% of donor white blood cells in the whole blood, so CD3, CD19, CD3, or and CD56 positive blood cells. If you go left to right, you can see that the donors and the patients were randomized. The donor underwent mobilization of stem cells using uh, granule site colony stimulating factor. These cells were uh, cryopreserved, a phrase cryopreserved, and then the patient would be brought in for a transplant. At the time of transplant, the patient, the recipient, would get conditioning with the ATG, five doses, day zero through four, total lymph irradiation, day one through 11. Steroids were only given on the first 10 to nine days, and then the CNI, which turned out to be tacrolimus in all the patients, was started on day one. MMF was started on day 11, but discontinued by day 39, such that by six weeks, patients were on tacrolimus monotherapy alone. If the patients were uh, continued to have mixed chimerism greater than or equal to 5%, then they were allowed to withdraw the tacrolimus over the next six months to be off all immune suppression by one year and followed for at least two, two years um, to see whether they maintained functional immune tolerance. This is a schematic showing step by step. One, the donor cells are collected and processed and cryopreserved. Two, the patient gets a kidney transplant. Three, the patient receives the low-dose TLI and ATG, as well as the other immunosuppressants I just described. And then a single uh, infusion of MDR is given, of the meteor product is given on day 11. We check for chimerism beginning at day 30 and we continue to check that serially throughout the study. This is the study update to date. So we randomized 22 pay, uh, donor recipient pairs in the MDR, 21 donors completed the phoresis, but 20 patients were transplanted in the active arm, 10 in the control arm. You can see that 19 uh, in the active arm had mixed chimerism by at least six months. I'll explain the one patient in a little bit. And immunosuppression was discontinued in all of these. All of them. Completed, the 14 patients have completed the study so far. Four patients are, are, are and 12 patients are at least five years out. Five have, uh, about, will be complete the study within six months. And we had one patient who discontinued prematurely. Again, I'll talk about that. So with mixed chimerism, 19 of uh, 95% uh, uh, of the total, 100% of the, uh, those, I'll explain, were chimeric at six months and 17 still at one year. That's important. Chimerism can be lost, and yet functional immune tolerance is uh, maintained. So 19 out of 19 had complete withdrawal of immune suppression. 17 out of 19 were off immune suppression, and 12 out of the 14 out at least two years are immunosuppressive uh, free. Four are progressing and are expect there don't seem to be any problems and will finish the study within six months. By re rejection occurred in two, and I'll de describe the details below, in the active arm, one, so 10% in each arm, death, graft loss, donor-specific uh, DNA development and specifically graft versus host disease did not develop in any of the patients. Regarding the acute rejection, one patient had a T cell mediated rejection, BAMF 1A, at day 365, but also had recurrent IgA, which looks like a rejection. One patient had a TCMR 1B, but had BK, which also looks like rejection. One MDR, one patient had borderline changes, which on uh, day 730, got treated briefly for a month with prednisone and remains off in immunosuppression now. In the control arm, there's one 1B rejection at day 178, and that patient had a BK, interestingly, at day 360, and one patient had borderline changes. One of the patients with recurrent IgA had graft loss in full disclosure. That patient lost the graft loss 4.3 years after transplant. These are the safety results, and basically there is no differences in adverse events in the recipients, 
in terms of treatment adverse events, serious adverse events, transplant related events, events of special interest. Looking down at the bottom, uh, towards the bottom of the table, you can see PK infection occurred in one, as I described, of the active arm, but three of the control recipients, no DAT was no difference, one and one. And recurrent disease, uh, there were two patients, as I described, in the active arm with the uh, with recurrent IgA. This is another way of looking at this. I kind of like this presentation. It shows in teal the patient's off immune suppression. You can see that almost everyone was off immune suppression during this. In gray is a special patient uh, that withdrew from this study. And then I'll talk about that. And in orange is the tr treatment failures. Um, so number on the left, number, number one is that uh, number seven was not an HLA fully matched. It was a protocol deviation, and the patient had initial chimerism. It did not persist out to six months and was not allowed to continue in the trial per the protocol design. Three patients who resumed immune suppression, two with IgA recurrence. That's actually interesting because there are six total, and two, one third developed recurrent IgA. And number 16 was a patient with rejection at 11.1 months um, after uh, withdrawal. A very important part of this is we, this, the Meteor study included the patient voice, and this was designed from the beginning to have the kidney disease quality of life short form KDQOL SF36 scores. And what you can see on the left is that the burden of kidney disease, which is, the, which is not only is the patient, um, the patient feels the burden of the disease, but I really like this is the patient feels that they are a burden. That person is a burden to, the, to their family or friends. Uh, very interesting, because remember these are two haplotype living related transplant recipients. They're on low dose immune suppression, but you can see just by TAC monotherapy in this small group of patients, there's al already a trend, possibly clinically significant, with a p value of 0.09 for a, uh, a better score in terms of burden of kidney disease. And then on the right is the mental health composite score, and it's, that's similar. When you get off immune suppression, patients feel better. In conclusion, the MDR 101 results to date demonstrate the ability to achieve mixed chimerism in HLA identical living related donor transplants with allowing elimination of all immune suppression without subsequent development of either rejection, serious rejection, or graft versus host disease. The proportion of patients experience an adverse event and a serious adverse event or treatment um, uh, emergent adverse event did not di differ between the two groups. The kidney disease quality of life show was improved more in the treatment group and then in the control. And to date, treatment success at least two years of immunosuppression free was 12 out of 19, 63%. The goal was 48%. And four treated patients remain off immune suppression and will complete the study within six months. Thank you for your attention. These are the centers that participated. I also want to especially thank the donors. We kind of forget about those. The donors are really important. Thank you.